Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of our Thrive in China Roundtable. If you're not familiar with our Thrive in China Roundtable, these are weekly roundtables that happen every single Wednesday around different topics uh, on creating business models for the Hong Kong Chinese market, talking about corporate administration uh, in both jurisdictions, as well as new laws, regulations, trends that we are seeing uh, within 2024. Before we start today's topic, which is on the employer of record scheme, just a brief introduction on who we are. Uh, my company is called Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. We are one of the most trusted business setup and corporate advisory and administration firms um, in China, as well as in Hong Kong. We are 100% focused on inbound investment into Hong Kong and China. That means 100% of our clients are foreign investment of foreign investors coming from a variety of different jurisdictions, uh, predominantly the US, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, but also from the Benelux, German, Swiss, Austrian region. Our services range from everything from trademark registrations to employer of record uh, schemes, all the way through to corporate establishment and ongoing outsourced um, administrative solutions like outsourcing your accounts, tax, payroll, et cetera. A little bit about myself. Let me just switch slides. My name is Christina kohler Kaluchi. I'm the head of business advisory at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. My focus for the last 20 years has been specifically on the Chinese market. Um, I've worked with over 750 companies on their market entry, their implementation, and then ultimately their growth and scaling uh, within this territory. So in today's topic, we are talking about the employer of record model. Now, the whole point of this model of this roundtable is to understand what the model entails, what are the compliance and legal considerations you have to make, what potentially are some of the disadvantages, what does it mean to have an agile workforce in the Hong Kong and Chinese market, and ultimately, how can you, with this model, mitigate your risk and be cost efficient? Everybody is on a tight budget. So that is what we're going to be focusing on today. So the first chapter for today is understanding the EOR model. So I've got this beautiful scheme up here to highlight to you what it actually looks like. So as an employer of record organization, it means that we can em employ and pay full-time employees. Um, the employment relationship is with us with Woodburn, uh, but ultimately the working relationship, the day-to-day -day relationship is with you. So ultimately what this scheme means is that if you're based in the UK, the US, Canada, you've got somebody on the ground you wanna hire in either Hong Kong or in China, Woodburn accountants and advisors can hire those individuals on a full-time basis, taking on the full responsibility around payroll, around social insurance and housing fund. In Hong Kong, it's the Mandatory Provident Fund, um, taking care of benefits that might be provided to them like housing allowances or stipends around meals, transportation, and ultimately Woodburn takes on the full risk of that employee relationship. However, from a day-to-day -day basis, the relationship, the day-to-day -day relationship of the the duties and responsibilities related to that employment is done directly with your company. So you manage the work schedule, the daily tasks, the KPIs of that individual, and ultimately have a say around salary increases and bonuses that are also being provided. The whole point of this scheme is allowing you to be able to set up within 10, 15 working days, in a new jurisdiction. Now, why would you use an employer record scheme? In Hong Kong and China, we are seeing that companies want to use the employer record scheme in order to onboard local staff, uh, i.e. localize the operations 
for client meetings, sales support, supply management, um, particularly in the period where it doesn't warrant having its own entity on the ground. Alternatively, you may be wanting to test the market, right? You want to test the Chinese and APAC market, hire local staff to do market research, marketing activities, market exploration, et cetera. Or ultimately, you want to second or send over an overseas-based contractor to Hong Kong and China for a project basis. Or you have the intention of setting up a company in China. However, you beat, beat the, the speed of the incorporation and you've got people that you really don't want to lose. You want to hire them. And in this interim period, until they can be formally employed by your own entity or your own structure, you can use this EOR scheme. Now, we have also had clients who've used the EOR model for situations where it is they will never get the go ahead to set up an entity or it might take a year to two years before the board of directors will give the go ahead. And as a consequence, they are hiring people in this interim period so they don't lose on time. Now, what are the disadvantages of the EOR model? Um, you know, I can talk all day long about the positives, but we do have to highlight the negatives. And the reality of the situation is that the EOR model does not provide a sense of belonging to the employees. In fact, it could give them a sense of hesitation of whether they should actually be employed or not. Why? Because the company is not taking that commitment to set up a formal entity in China, and the employee is ultimately being employed by an intermediary so you can imagine it doesn't give a sense of stability to that individual. Now, it might not be easy as well to find and hire employees who are willing to go under this model for the fact, again, that they don't feel secure in working with an intermediary. Another aspect is that the EOR provider or HR service provider who is offering this model, they're gonna utilize their standard employment contracts in relation to these types of employments. So one of the negatives is that the client cannot really tailor make that employment contract to fit all of the clauses, terms, and conditions that they perhaps would like. Don't forget these employment contracts are also based on the Chinese law, if the person's going to be based in mainland China, or on the Hong Kong law, if they're going to be based in Hong Kong. Now, based on the Chinese law, uh, the employment contract term cannot be lower than one year. In Hong Kong, you have that flexibility where it can be shorter than that. But again, if you only sign a contract for one year, it perhaps does not give a sense of stability to those employees. What do you need to take into consideration? And I, I wanna highlight this particularly for China. In Hong Kong, it's a common law scheme. So the employment, uh, the way of employing individuals is pretty much standard compared to how you would employ people in other Western countries. Um, in China, the difference is, is that the country is so large, uh, based on where this individual is reside, so, no, let me rephrase that, based on where this uh, individual is employed. So I'll give you the an example of Woodburn. We have our entity based in Shanghai. If this person is based in Shanghai, no issues whatsoever. They will go on the social insurance and housing fund scheme of Shanghai. However, if you decide that you want to employ somebody that's based in Kunming, in Nanjing, in Wuxi, in Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Beijing, and other jurisdictions within China, and they are hired by Woodburn, they would have to follow still the Shanghai Social Insurance and Housing Fund scheme. This might be a negative for certain employees and again may deter them from signing up and accepting employment. Uh, if they are all good and well accepting the Shanghai social insurance schemes, then no problem whatsoever. However, if they don't accept it, then you have to find other candidates or you have to find a third party local agency in that city who's willing to hire those individuals. Now, things that you have to think about in terms of the EOR model. One is legal compliance. Why are you choosing this scheme? Ultimately, you want to make sure these individuals are employed properly in China, that you are following governing employment relationships, that there are employment contracts, potentially employee handbooks, that you're calculating the wages, working hours, social insurance, employee benefits, and you're adding everything together and you're remaining in compliance. 
what you want is that there's an official employer of record for these employees that are located either in China or Hong Kong. Employment contracts are critical, particularly in China, but actually they're critical in any jurisdiction that you go to. The EOR, the employer of record, will sign an employment contract directly with the workers on behalf of the client company. These contracts will outline the terms and conditions of the employment, including the job responsibility, compensation, termination provisions. It is very rare that the EOR provider will um, agree to changing certain terms and conditions. They really will abide by their standard contracts. Now, the EOR basically ensures that the contracts comply with the Hong Kong or Chinese labor laws and that they protect the interests of both the employer and the employee. Now, the downside to all of this is that potentially they do not protect the ultimate employer, which is your company overseas. Um, I did a very short video the other day on one of the downsides to this scheme, which is the fact that your IP protection might not be completely there because ultimately you are, although you are the day-to-day -day contact for these employees, the employee has never signed a contract with you in terms of IP protection, um, uh, sensitive material like pricing information, et cetera. So it might be worthwhile to sign these separate agreements directly with the employees for that protection or to include those in the service agreement with the employer of record. Now the employer of record can also sponsor visas um, for expatriates to be deployed or seconded to China as well as in Hong Kong. Um, as expatriates, you do need to have a work permit and a residence visa to reside in China and Hong Kong. And there's going to be a myriad of rules and regulations that you have to abide by. If they are employed by Woodburn, this is again the responsibility of Woodburn to make sure all their papers are in order and that they have the right visas and work permits to uh, reside and live there and be employed there. The ER also manages the full payroll pro processing and that can be everything from uh, calculating the full salary compensation and the breakdown from gross salary all the way through to net salary, thinking about social insurance contributions, statutory benefits, um, additional allowances that are being offered by the ultimate company, um, housing fund contributions. Uh, in Hong Kong, you have to think about mandatory provident fund. <laughs> and then you may also want to provide additional benefits like additional medical insurance, additional um, dentistry insurances, travel insurances, etc. So it is important as a company to discuss with your EO, EO provider what benefits can be offered and whether you want to offer those benefits. But I want people to remember one thing. When you are offering all of these payroll and benefits to your employees through the EOR, if you ever do decide to set up your own local entity, you've got to maintain those benefits under your own local entity and realize what those costs might be and how they may affect you when you are establishing an entity. If you are using another EOR provider and unfortunately they have not gone through the full breakdown of all the benefits and you do decide to set up an entity and then realize that they haven't done what you wanted, it's a renegotiation with those employees on how you're gonna set up those schemes on your own company. To give you an example, um, there is an EOR provider who has a um, um, voluntary compensation benefit that is offered to all employees within the company, as well as the EOR employees. Um, and as a consequence, if you move them over to your own entity, you may not even be able to offer that because you're not big enough in size. So this is just the transparency that you need to understand and need to be aware of. Another is compliance management, right? When you are hiring people in China, you have to take on the responsibility, or in Hong Kong, you have to take on the responsibility of handling disputes, handling grievances, um, and handling all of the <laughs> annual leaves that are associated. For example, maternity leave, uh, leave if there's a death in the family, public holidays, um, regular holidays, 
uh, but also if there are disputes and the fact that there are no salary increases or bonuses, that all, all that compliance, although the EOR is abiding by what the company tells them to do, it is the EOR's responsibility to make the, have these discussions and discuss them with the various employees. Now, the biggest benefit, in my opinion, around the EOR model, especially for those that are new market entrants and really do kind of don't want to put all their eggs in one basket but, and kind of want to test the market, is that it offers you flexibility and scalability, right? Um, if you're looking to expand your operations into China or Hong Kong, you can hire talent through these EOR providers, even if they are short-term projects, seasonal hiring, long-term staffing needs. The EOR basically is doing a quick onboard, offboard for these employees based on your requirements. So it's giving you the ability to have an agile workforce management without taking on the burden of the disputes, the discussions, uh, the administrative burden of doing that all under your own legal entity. And last but not least is cultural understanding and communication. When we talk about disputes, sometimes it's just a cultural misunderstanding. And by using an EOR provider who is physically based in the territory and is on the ground to be able to communicate or meet with your employees directly, it gives you the ability to bridge this cultural linguistic barrier and facilitate that communication and deal with the nuances that perhaps you're not even aware about, right? So a lot of these disputes can be settled simply by having this outsourced provider on the ground handling these types of discussions and handling that effective collaboration and relationship with the employees. Now, the next topic we're going to be looking at is compliance and legal considerations, uh, which are crucial aspects under the employer of record model in both China and in Hong Kong. So I wanna to touch a little bit on the key compliance and legal considerations. And I've highlighted 10, 10 of these. One is the labor contracts. So Chinese labor law particularly mandates that every employee must have a written employment contract that complies with the local regulations. The ER is responsible for drafting and managing these contracts on behalf of you the company that is looking to implement this EOR model. Um, they are also then responsible for looking at the job responsibilities, the compensation, the working hours, the probation periods, the termination clause, and making sure that the labor contracts, contracts encompass everything. My recommendation, so labor contracts are needed as a minimum. There are penalties associated if you don't sign labor contracts with your employees. It means that double pay is owed to each employee until that labor contract is signed. Uh, so it is really important to have them. I haven't highlighted it here because it's not a key compliance and legal consideration. It's totally up to you. The EOR will probably also provide an employee handbook detailing the operation and the ins and outs of communication and leave and breach of contract. We do recommend that these employee handbooks are also signed. The next one is minimum wage requirements. Now, each province in China sets its own minimum wage standards. The EUR must ensure that the employees are paid at least the minimum wage applicable to their respective locations. Now, of course, if you don't pay these minimum wages, then the employees can go to the labor arbitration um, and file a complaint. It is up to the EOR to explain to you what the minimum wages are and how they can affect then your budget of hiring these employees. Social insurance contributions. Employers in China are required to contribute to the social insurance and housing fund schemes. This includes pension, medical insurance, unemployment insurance, work-related insurance, uh, maternity insurance. The EOR's responsibility is to accurately calculate and remit these contributions on behalf of the client company to its employees. In Hong Kong, the equivalent of that would be the Mandatory Provident Fund. The Mandatory Provident Fund is a pension scheme, um, which uh, uh, a portion is paid by the employee and a portion is paid by the employer. Tax compliance employers in China 
as well as in Hong Kong, are responsible for withholding and remitting individual income tax on behalf of their employees. Again, the calculation of the IIT based on the income levels, the applicable tax rates, we've got to just make sure that in both jurisdictions, there is a timely submission for, to these tax authorities. And, you know, if you want to maintain these relationships and have a good standing, it's always good as well for your HR department in the home jurisdiction to make sure that these contributions and co tax compliances are actually occurring. <coughs> Excuse me. And the fifth one is work permits and visas, like I mentioned earlier. Foreigners must obtain work permits and visas if they're going to be relocating to Hong Kong or China. And again, viewers can offer this. Now, applying for work permits and visas is never an easy task in new jurisdictions. Um, in Hong Kong and China, they will always ask the company, why do you need to hire a foreigner versus hiring somebody local? So you, it's up to the OR to really provide proof that this is a, a required um, individual that needs to be based there. Employee benefits and leave entitlements. The labor laws stipulate various employee benefits and entitlements, including paid annual leave, public holidays, sick leave, maternity leave, leave, and again, the OR must ensure that these employees receive these entitled benefits and educate you, the clients, the companies, on what these holidays and statutory requirements are. Data privacy and protection has become a, an extremely hot topic in the last two years. The collection, storage, and processing of the employee data in China are subject to data privacy and protection regulations. The, OR, the, EOR, the EOR must implement appropriate measures to safeguard employee data and ensure compliance with the data privacy laws. You will find in most employment contracts in China now an appendix to the contract highlighting the data privacy regulations of their company and how they manage it. Termination procedures, again, terminating employment contracts must adhere to specific protocols uh, that follow labor regulations in Hong Kong as well as in China. Again, the EOR is responsible for the termination procedures. However, it is also up to the client to respect the employees and deal in a fair and safe playing field. Um, but obviously it is up to the EOR to then, you know, try and avoid potential disputes or legal challenges. Contractual agreements. Um, there needs to be clear contractual agreements between the EOR, EOR and the client company um, to delineate roles, responsibilities, liabilities. Uh, the contracts should address issues such as service levels, indemnification, confidentiality, dispute resolution mechanisms, et cetera. And the last but not least is obviously engaging legal counsel with expertise in the local laws um, that can help both the EOR provider as well as the client company navigate the complexities of these regulations, um, but also ensure that you mitigate any risks and liabilities. Now, one question I did want to highlight and separate from everything else is freelancing. Freelancing is a relatively hot topic um, in China. Basically, for me, my definition is, is that you, the client company abroad, signs an agreement under your legislation, under your regulations with somebody that is based in mainland China. Now, freelancing is not governed by any Chinese labor law regulation. Uh, it's not a legally binding contract. Um, legally binding contracts can only come to play if these employees are employed by a locally registered company. Now, this is then not to say that it's not forbidden for a Chinese person in China or in Hong Kong to work for an overseas entity as a freelancer. It's just that you have to understand what the local laws and regulations are. Many freelancers in China who are employed in this manner by overseas entities tend not to pay their income tax, tend not to contribute to their social insurance and housing funds, and then it can lead to issues where the freelancer uses that as leverage against you. And ultimately you can be put on the blacklist with the labor arbitration, um, uh, uh, labor bureau ultimately. So it is important to check on what you're doing with freelancing. Um, it's potentially something I would tell people to try and avoid. Uh, it gives way too much leverage to the freelancers. Um, 
I would rather go with the employer of record scheme. The next topic we're looking at is having an agile workforce. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to bring out some stats because I think this is interesting. As of June, 2023, there were 507 0.5 million employees in China that had used online services to work from home. And that's accounting for 47% of all the Chinese internet user base. Now, all of this is because of the lockdowns during COVID-19 and the inclination of companies to move into a remote working environment, okay? Um, in fact, many companies have even in China have downsized their office space in order to be able to promote more remote working. Just a minor disclaimer, there are no labor laws around remote working. It is considered as a luxury. You just really have to be careful that not your entire labor force is remote working and that you still have an office uh, with workstations available. Um, China's technology sector has really been at the forefront of embracing this remote working philosophy. Uh, Trip.com, one of China's largest online travel platforms has advocated for a more open approach to remote work, allowing employees to work from home or other remote locations. Tech savvy uh, individuals in China have also embraced remote work, choosing to work from regional towns and other remote locations contributing to the rise of digital nomads. Uh, and this obviously reflects a growing acceptance of remote working in the tech industry. Traditional industries such as manufacturing and retail have also recognized the need to adapt to this changing uh, work landscape. Uh, and as remote work becomes more common, these industries are likely to explore ways to incorporate more remote working options. Even the educational realm has witnessed a substantial upswing in online teaching and e-learning platforms, offering new avenues again for educators um, to remote work. So what does this mean? Ultimately, it means that this transformation has necessitated adaptations to working hours, time management, and leaving entitlements. But what it does offer is an agile workforce, an agile workforce that you can remotely place. How does this translate to the EOR model? Well, the employer record model ultimately is taking employees, telling them they can re work remotely, but also then gives you this agility to downsize and upscale when and if needed. And it's all coming down to the fact that China is definitely more advanced in the technological space than they are in the Western world. In addition to that, with the fact that you are employing somebody from your home jurisdiction in China, that's anyway remote working to say the least. Um, so you're just expanding that to the fact that you, again, it's cost efficiency. You don't have to rent an office space if you don't want to. However, I do want to highlight that while an agile workforce in China, as well as in Hong Kong, offers numerous advantages, it also presents challenges and disadvantages that I do want to highlight in today's um, episode, predominantly because these are the challenges we see with our EOR clients in terms of maintaining the working relationships with their employees on the ground. So the first one is the cultural and organizational resistance. Um, traditional hierarchical structures and cultural norms <clears throat> prevalent in Chinese organizations may hinder the adoption of agile practices, resistance to change, fear of failure, reluctance to deviate from the established processes can impede the transition to a more agile mindset and inhibit collaboration and innovation. Language barriers and communication gaps may pose challenges in cross-functional collaboration and knowledge sharing within agile teams, especially in multinational organizations operating from abroad within China. Effective communication strategies and language support are essential to ensure clarity, alignment, mutual understanding amongst all team members throughout all offices. 
risk of overcommitment and burnout, the iterative and fast paced nature of agile methodologies can sometimes lead to overcommitment, unrealistic expectations, burnout amongst employees, particularly in high pressure environments. It's really crucial to strike a balance between agility and sustainability. Um, you've got to provide these employees with a work-life balance, promoting employee well-being, ultimately to prevent burnout, as well as turnover, which is a big subject in China. <clears throat> Excuse me. Resource constraints, constraints and skill gaps. Um, building and sustaining an agile workforce in China, as well as in Hong Kong, requires investment in talent development, training, skill enhancement initiatives. Um, resource constraints and skill gaps may limit the organization's ability to recruit, to retain and develop employees with, with, requisite, um, with requisite competencies and capabilities needed for these agile roles and responsibilities. Ultimately, you're already creating an environment with the or a model of instability. You want to at least then provide as a benefit these trainings and, and further developments. Regulatory and compliance complexities, navigating regulatory and compliance requirements in the business environment we are in can be complex and challenging, particularly for startups in China. Adhering to labor laws, tax regulations, data privacy requirements, legal obligations, you know, it can put a hindrance on being agile and flexible. Coordination across teams, Many organizations operate across multiple locations and time zones, making coordination, collaboration a significant challenge, managing dependencies, synchronizing workflows, maintaining alignment across the different cultures, geographic contexts, requires really a robust communication channel and collaboration tools, as well as leadership support. Don't forget about the teams that you are building up in China and in Hong Kong. Um, Another point I want to highlight there is I have actually one client who's using the EOR model and uh, the headquarters is in Germany, the team is in China, and they actually have a starting time for the Chinese team of 11 a.m. all the way through to 8 p.m. So they've got an adjusted uh, working hour scheme to fit with Germany and to build up on that communication. Resistance to empowerment and decentralization. <clears throat> embracing empowerment, autonomy, decentralized decision-making is fundamental to agile practices. Um, however, traditional management practices and top-down leadership styles prevalent in most Chinese organizations may resist delegating authority, sharing control, and empowering the employees. And again, this hinders then the agile initiatives that you want to create. Establishing clear metrics, performance indicators, accountability mechanisms is essential for evaluating the effectiveness and impact of an agile initiative. So you've got to be very clear and meaningful about the metrics, tracking progress, attributing outcomes to specific actions or decisions may be challenging and complex, uh, particularly if you are working further away. So despite these challenges though, organizations can mitigate the disadvantages of an agile workforce by fostering openness, experimentation, continuous learning, investing in leadership, uh, changing management capabilities, aligning agile initiatives with strategic business objectives. Uh, by obviously addressing these challenges proactively, you can drive innovation and can grow in this dynamic landscape that we are in. So as I mentioned here, the advantages that I see in this type of workforce is adaptability, flexibility, collaboration, continuous learning, um, and ultimately technology adoption and digital transformation. <clears throat> so let's finish off today's episode with risk mitigation and cost efficiency. So the employer record model offers several advantages for businesses looking to expand their operations or hire talent in China and Hong Kong. And I wanna highlight some of these key advantages. 
The first is a global expansion to China and Hong Kong with reduced risk. The EOR is the legal entity in these two jurisdictions that are navigating the complexities around regulatory environments that you don't even have to think about this. This allows you to expand into China and Hong Kong without thinking about the formal legislation and the compliance risks. Compliance management, again, all on the shoulders of the EOR provider. When you're talking about local labor laws, tax regulations, employment standards, handling the processing of payroll, social contributions, all of these, by, by basically outsourcing all of these compliance management issues to the EOR, you can focus on your core operations. Fast to time, faster time to market. Ultimately, if you've got somebody, you can put them on the ground within 10 to 15 working days. Uh, the onboarding process is relatively quick, much faster than obviously setting up an entity. In Hong Kong, to set up an entity would also take between five to 10 working days, but the bank account opening might take several months. In China, from start to finish, an incorporation could also take between three to six months. So you are deploying resources into these jurisdictions at a much, much faster pace. Again, without having to think about compliance and decision-making points, the legal aspects, the compliance aspects of running and maintaining an entity. <clears throat> Flexible workforce solutions. We talked a lot about agility. And the whole point of using the ER model is that it gives you this flexibility, this flexibility to downsize, upscale, have, employees that are there on a temporary basis, right? It gives you this incredible flexibility. Cost efficiency. We are here because we want to save money. Now, let's face it. If you use an EOR model, it will be cheaper for you than actually physically setting up an entity in China and Hong Kong. Think about those incorporation fees, compliance fees, and all of those ongoing administrative overheads that you have to think about. There are significant upfront investments that have to happen when you set up your own structure in these two jurisdictions. By eliminating that, you are optimizing your cost efficiency and your resource allocation by outsourcing everything to an EOR provider. Ultimately, <laughs> giving you the focus to concentrate purely on your core business activities. Sales business development, sourcing, whatever that might be, and offloading then all of the administrative burdens on that EOR provider. Now, I just wanna highlight one question that might be popping in into the chat box is, what is my trigger to ultimately then set up an entity? Um, I think basically, if you understand how much it's gonna cost you roughly to set up an entity, uh, Follow with all the compliance regulations, like having a registered office address, meaning you have to rent in space, um, and all the ongoing administrative burdens and overheads that you have to think about. And then calculating the quantity of employees and the service provider fees for that EOR model. If it comes to a relatively similar amount, then you need to start thinking about moving. So for me, usually the threshold is around three to four employees where I would say, okay, the cost of that EOR model versus having your own structure, you're pretty much on par. Adding then the fifth employee, you're going to be spending more on the EOR model than if you were actually to set up your own structure. So ultimately, to finish off today's presentation, we're looking at the efficiency of an EOR model to start off, expand into China, APAC, Hong Kong optimize your workforce management, and then also have an HR provider on the ground who is supporting you with all of the information you need to unlock this new growth potential and opportunity that exists. Um, so that's actually the end of today's presentation, guys. Uh, one thing I will also highlight is that there are a lot of EOR providers out there who have partners that they work with in China and Hong Kong, but they themselves don't have physical entities. Um, you can absolutely use them, especially if you're using them on a global scale in other jurisdictions. If you are purely expanding into Hong Kong and China, try and work with 
structures that have legal entities on the ground, that's just going to basically eliminate the middleman for you. Um, and again, empower your expansion. So if you are ready to get started and you're interested in these services, then don't hesitate to contact us. Happy to have a free 30 minute call to um, explore, uh, explore all of this. If you would like to join our WeChat community, our Thrive in China WeChat community, please do so. This is the QR code to me. Happy to network with you. Just type in Thrive in China and I'll also then connect you into our WeChat community. Unfortunately, due to the size, I can't send you direct invitations any longer. I have to send you invitations one by one through me. But please do join us. Please do connect with me. Happy to have a chat on WeChat as well. Next on our agenda, next week, we've got our Blueprint for Success, your ultimate guide to China's incorporation process, where we're also going to touch on the new company law regulations that are going to be implemented as of 1st of July. Uh, then we're on Chinese New Year holiday, which is wonderful news. And then we're back up on the 21st of February with determining startup funds and then ultimately recruiting your first stars um, for, for, for your China operation. No questions have popped in. So I do want to thank you all for joining us. Don't hesitate to reach out to us. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.